On the west side of Vancouver Island stands Pacific Rim National Park Reserve, one of Canada's most beautiful and powerful parks. Raging Pacific storms pound 125 kilometers of rugged western shore into one of the world's premier coastal temperate rainforests, dumping an average annual rainfall of nearly three and a half meters. Every year, $100,000 in damage occurs from fallen trees smashing apart the West Coast Trail. This rainforest exists because land meets sea right here. And where the two meet, where they crash against each other, you've got this coastal temperate rainforest. From giant marine mammals to the most fragile rainforest ecology, Pack Rim in spring showcases the struggle for survival on a rugged windswept coast. Established in 1970, Pacific Rim was Canada's first West Coast National Park. It's made up of three integral parts, encompassed by the traditional territories of the Nuchalnul First Nations people. Long Beach is the most accessible of Pack Rim's three units and is a core protected area within the Clayquot Sound's UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. Located between the villages of Euclid and Tofino, it lies at the end of the Pacific Rim Highway. The second unit is called the Broken Group Islands, located between Euclid and Bamfield at the mouth of Barclay Sound. 100 islands cover 106 square kilometers of marine archipelago that's only accessible by boat. The West Coast Trail is the third and most southern unit running 75 kilometers. Its world famous trail is part of 256 square kilometers of wilderness between Bamfield and Port Renfrew. And then there's the ocean. Some of Pacific Rim National Park's most inspiring moments can be spent in a boat, searching for a glimpse of wildlife in their natural marine habitat. What's important right at this time of the year for whale watching is that it's the, uh, the spring migration, the gray whales. And they spend their winter in, uh, in Mexico. It's where they breed and have their babies. And then uh, they migrate up the coast to Alaska. If you come out here on the water, you're most likely to see gray whales or humpback whales. You've got a good chance of seeing some harbor porpoise as well. Sometimes gulls porpoises, but not too often. If you go further offshore, you'll see some Pacific white-sided dolphins. And um, the neat thing is, is that most of these species are all listed as a species at risk. And we're finding all of them here in this area. So the park plays quite a, quite a role in trying to protect them. The 
ecosystem is so healthy here that the same migrating gray whales are often seen more than once a year. Gray whale population in the eastern North Pacific is about 20,000. Huge numbers considering they were on the brink of extinction 50 years ago. Species at Risk funding helps biologists monitor the ever-changing population of these giant summer residents. There's about 250 of the entire 20,000 population that um, choose to stay along our shores to feed. And this is usually the first time we see them at, at uh, this time of year. And a lot of these animals are known as the summer residents. So they'll feed during the herring spawn, they take off for a little bit, and usually we see the exact same individuals later on in the summertime. But the whales are not alone in this marine paradise. Joining the resident whales are sea lions. At uh, any one time, there's up to about 20% of the BC population of stellar sea lions in Pacific Rim National Park. So it's quite an important area for them. And uh, that's known as critical habitat here in the park. And as many as 150 pups have been seen at any one time at one particular haulout known as Pagina. California sea lions are extremely intelligent, easily adapt to man-made environments, and the males can weigh up to 400 kilograms. Sea lions are known to be considered as an indicator of ecosystem health, as well as indicators of fish diversity, because their diet is so incredibly diverse. California sea lions, for example, are known to eat over 50 different species of fish, and they also eat octopus and squid. Getting visitors up close and personal can be a mission. As a rule, tour operators and biologists must give wildlife their space and maintain about 100 meters distance. While the ocean is a popular spot for visitors in springtime, so too are the park's rainforests. The Pacific Rim's coastal temperate rainforests have evolved to withstand the sea's raging intensity 365 days of the year, 24-7. We get three meters and 28 centimeters of rain per year, and that creates a special type of forest. The first line of defense is the formidable Sitka spruce. It can grow to 100 meters tall and boasts a trunk you could drive a small car through. Their unique bark allows them to withstand the harsh salt wind. Sheltered behind the Sitka, cedar and hemlock trees grow. Protected from the ravaging winds, some of these western red cedars are as old as the Great Wall of China. Then, sprouting up from all the acidic soil, the shore pine. The combination of these four trees absorb the Pacific's constant assault and help the forest thrive. This is my, my eighth season on uh, the West Coast Trail. What I really like about this area is exactly this, is that it's so dynamic. It, it isn't the kind of trail where it's the same year after year and you start to get bored with it. It changes so much that uh, really this stretch of trail, you could never really get bored with it.
What keeps this park so wild and dynamic are the Pacific storms. In 2006, high winds and an estimated 100 millimeters of rain in 24 hours blew down about 2,000 trees. Three to five acre swaths had nothing left standing. Stretches of the trail were impassable. And this is the kind of thing I find so disorienting because where else in life do, you, do things go from the vertical to the horizontal overnight? Yeah, I'm at uh, bridge 20. Uh, we seem to have a bit of a problem here. This was 92 feet long, and a, looks like a cedar hit the middle span and has basically taken it right out. The damage is massive. These fallen giants make you feel small. I used to be shocked every spring when we would hike through and we would see the damage, but after seven years, uh, you just, you've just I've come to expect it. Uh, even in relatively mild winters, we, we can get $100,000 worth of damage on the trail. When you see this damage, uh, you tend to think of it maybe in urban terms of uh, you know destruction, but really it's, it's a natural event and it's all gonna be part of the natural environment and it's all gonna be nutrients for the future forest. But even with such extensive damage, they don't shut the trail down. It's just too popular. They build a temporary detour until the damage is fixed. With so much diversity in Pacific Rim National Park Reserve comes popularity. In fact, the park has a reputation for being so busy in the summer that it's almost impossible to book a visit. One of the myths about the West Coast Trail is that you have to book a year in advance because it's really hard to get on. And that's actually, it's not so much the case. The trails open usually the 1st of May until the end of September. Nowadays, you can still reserve for the high season, which is mid-June to mid-September. But most of the time, people are able to get on the trail without a reservation. You meet a superb uh, crowd on the trails. It's uh, very enriching, not only for the body, but for the soul as well. This is no ordinary hike through the park. Once you start out on the trail, there's no turning back. The only way out is by helicopter. You're really in touch with nature, and it, it is definitely a humbling experience and something that I think is crucial. My suggestion is to take a week out of your life every year and spend on the trail, this trail or any other trail. Just like there are forests on land, there are forests in the sea. Competing for sunlight and supporting undersea populations. If you were to go underwater here, what you would find is you'd find forests of kelp, really tall seaweeds attached to the bottom, growing up towards the sunlight. And on those seaweeds, you have other seaweeds growing. So it's just like the mosses and the lichens that grow on some of the, the trees in the forest. The park is home to nearly 300 archaeological sites. Evidence of New Chal Nuelth settlement and heritage dates back 5,000 years. The New Channel have no word for wild or wilderness. There's only home. And that's the basic philosophy of, of New Channel people. And that's how we live on the landscape. 
We have a number of founding values or principles that we live by, ESOC, which is respect, or Ishuk Ishawak. Everything is one and everything is interconnected. The Nuchal North Trail is a 2.5 kilometer historic hiking path. It connects Florencia Bay to South Beach and Wiccaninish Beach. We have 12 interpretive signs that are trilingual, English, French, and New Channel. And each sign tells a story about the New Channel's culture and its relationship to the land. Sharing their intimate knowledge of all aspects of the park's ecosystem fosters respect for its valuable resources and their continuing history of sustainability. I think Parks Canada has a key role in interpreting Aboriginal cultures, particularly to help Canadians and visitors and others understand the importance of, of, the, of Aboriginal cultures in Canada. Also the complexities and, and the sheer variety of First Nations that inhabit this landscape. This one corner of Vancouver Island is home to a bounty of cultural treasures, diverse habitat, and wildlife. Despite the richness of the environment, it is also home to 42 species at risk, from tiny flowers and amphibians to the entire dune system that runs along the coast. Pacific Rim National Park teems with life on land and in the sea. Still, one of the biggest threats to these protected areas are introduced species. Bullfrogs are not native here, but if they get introduced, they basically eat everything in a pond that they're introduced in. They're quite big frogs. They can get up to uh, 20 centimeters, so about so big and they can basically eat anything they can fit in their mouths. So small fish, other amphibians, even ducklings if they can get them. Invasive species don't just drift into their new environments. Usually humans are at the root of their introduction. People will find tadpoles, they'll raise them, they'll become adult frogs, and people think, okay, well, we should return these to the wild. Oh, there's a pond just down the road, or even better, ah, oh, there's a national park down the road. My bullfrogs will be happy there, and they'll take them and they'll release them. Nature is change, and change is constant. These shifting mounds of sand make for a wondrous playground. But the force of one invasive plant species can trigger some radical transformations. One such struggle is being played out on the dunes. So here we're trying to do dune restoration uh, in this area, the Wiccaninish dune system, which is the largest dune system in, in British Columbia. And the restoration is twofold. One, getting rid of uh, mothla, which has been a very invasive dune grass, which has stopped sand movement and behind the, the dunes here, which has uh, made forest starting to come in so the dunes could disappear. So we want to make sure the dunes stay. So we'll take the amophila out and allow sand movement and all these species to proliferate. And the second thing, our last remaining plant, pink sand for being an endangered species, we're going to try and put it back. Planted in San Francisco in the mid-1800s to stabilize beach erosion, the Ammophila is fantastic at doing just that. It can survive floating at sea for six months, and eight-meter swells don't even make a dent in its resistant population. You know, normally you think about ecosystems as wanting to stable, but not, not here. These things need to shift constantly in order for these plants to survive. But plant restoration is a tricky business. It's tough keeping up with Mother Nature in one of the most rugged and shifting coastlines in the world. Standing on the dunes is like experiencing waves in slow motion. 
but standing on the ocean is the best way to appreciate the Pacific's full power. The water is a frigid 13 degrees Celsius. That's why four millimeter thick wetsuits are a must. Getting past the break is one thing. Conquering that surge to find the elusive wave is another. More popular than ever, Long Beach's surf community grows stronger every year, with flocks of surfers chasing waves and communing with the park. In the spring, the ocean is at its most unpredictable. But if you catch the right wave, it's well worth the wait. Pacific Rim National Park Reserve protects nearshore waters and Canada's western coastal lowland forests. Teeming with abundance, residents and visitors together witness and preserve this incredible park's destructive renewal. Start imagining this rainforest. Pick up pieces. As we go along, there's a tree planted in your rainforest mine. Fit in the birds, fit in the moss. What else is there in the rainforest? Slugs and trees. So start doing it. Pick up some of these pieces. Put them into your mind. Slowly, they'll become a rainforest in your mind, a picture. Any questions before we go looking for the rainforest? All right, let's go find the rainforest. <laughs> 